Divine Service is on page 184 of the hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of the Lord Jesus to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let's kneel. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have never offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering of his death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may stand for the intro. I will sing to the Lord. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. When light up my eyes, lest I see the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. By having trusted in your steadfast love, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me.
heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but not of my own will. And I am still trusted with its stewardship. That when that what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ is our master, 
the Lord who not only gave his life for us, but also our teacher who shows us how to live in the way that pleases God and blesses others. Mark the Evangelist records in today's Gospel a chronicle of one 24-hour period in Jesus' ministry, which may profit us as we meditate on how our Lord spent his time. Let us ask God's blessings as we reflect on a day in the life of our Lord. Almighty God, may the words of our lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. The first thing to note is that Jesus was a churchgoer. You hear people say they don't need to go to church. You hear people say it's what's in my heart that counts, not whether I get out and join other people. But that's a little like Amy Winehouse saying that she doesn't need no rehab. Singing that song hours before dying of an overdose. If our Lord attended faithfully the gathering of God's people for worship and instruction in the Word, how much more do all of us sinners? To tell the truth, we are all addicted to sin and need rehabilitation. And to pretend otherwise is to embrace the way of death. We need rehabilitation to be weaned from the allure of sin and its attraction. Especially when life changes come upon us and other things fill our time. Or other needs creep up on us we need to be on our guard at these times. For in new situations, we can respond the way others in our culture respond, rather than the way God would have us respond. And thus, we need His guidance. We need the support of fellow believers continuously. This is one reason why we begin many of our services admitting that we are poor, miserable sinners in need of forgiveness, <coughs> guidance, and divine help to live a life that honors God and blesses others. Now after church, that is after the synagogue service, Jesus went to the home of one of his disciples, mainly that of Simon Peter. It was the Sabbath day, and they honored the day of rest by not working. This rest did not preclude time together. Social life was part of Jesus' life, and we do well to recognize this. Most of us have been blessed by social events where we were welcome, made to feel important, where we were affirmed by others and affirmed others in return where only good and encouraging things were spoken because the most significant things in life are those blessings which God sends us. In your social interactions, try to find good things to say about every person you meet. Try to speak in ways that will uplift others, that will encourage and therefore, we talk of others' achievements and not their embarrassments. You know, as a child and adolescent, I did not understand this. I approached social gatherings with the attitude of what's in it for me, and so often I didn't find it because I was selfish and turned in on myself. I needed the truth of God, which my mother spoke, where she said, you go to this not to have a good time, but to help others to have a good time. And it took a long time for that truth to sink in. But now I recognize it and realize that this is what Jesus was doing. 
He was so good at social situations that he was frequently invited to homes of the both the rich and the poor, even by some who regarded him as an enemy, but nevertheless a desirable dinner guest. Now on this occasion, it happened that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was ill, and Jesus took an interest. He was able to help, so he did. You and I might be unable to heal the sick as our Lord did, but to take an interest, even take a risk by seeing, touching the sick, is an example for us. I do not say that we should throw medical precautions to the winds, but neither should we become fearful or legalistic, treating the sick as outcasts and ignoring their feelings. In our Lord's case, there was a difference in that healing flowed from him into the sick rather than sickness flowing to the healthy. For most of us sinners, Sin and sickness are contagious, while in Christ, forgiveness and health are contagious. But if we are able to channel the love of Christ, however faintly, we can encourage healing of body and spirit in others. Now Peter's mother-in-law recovered so quickly that she insisted on waiting on them. I had a mother-in-law like this. Doing things for you was how she expressed her love. And Jesus received her love, not necessarily by eating that third helping of pie, but by affirming the giver of the gift. Gifts create or affirm relationships. And truth be told, that's why we're sometimes reluctant to accept gifts from others. We don't want to be obligated. We don't want to be in the position of the receiver when the giver seems to be in the position of power. You see, gifts affirm or create relationships. And when we concern ourselves more with the gift than the unspoken message behind the gift, we reveal ourselves to be mercenary and self-focused rather than loving our neighbor. That's the meaning beside that old saying, you don't let, look a gift horse in the mouth. And that is to say you don't evaluate the gift in, in front of the giver because it shows you're focused on the wrong thing. Too often we think of love exclusively as serving but allowing ourselves to be served is also part of mutual respect and affirmation. Our Lord reflected this in accepting the gift of service from Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Now, what happens next in the text is not always understood by readers. If you look at verse 32, it says, That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Why? The Sabbath began sundown on Friday and ended sundown on Saturday. Thus, people could do the work of bringing the sick to Jesus when the sun set on that Sabbath. Jesus' mission was to proclaim the kingdom of God that is the reign of God over and against the chaos of the disordered world, the chaos of our corrupted flesh, the chaos of the ultimately self-defeating deceits of the devil. This chaos of evil is reflected in the bodies of the sick where the equilibrium of health has been upset. It's reflected in the ravings of the insane where disordered emotions rule through word and touch Prayer and command, Christ brought order and obedience to God's gracious will to these sufferers. In many cases, this was coupled explicitly with the forgiveness of sins. You recall that one incident when Jesus said to the paralytic who had been dropped through the roof, Son, be of good cheer, your sin is forgiven. 
not just those who suffer in an obvious physical way are to be brought into the kingdom of God, but every one of us who live in disobedience to God's good and gracious will. Therefore, we are taught by our Lord to pray that his kingdom come to us, that we may ourselves do God's good and gracious will. And that's an honor to God and a blessing to others. Notice the puzzling statement in verse 34. He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. The evil spirits knew that Jesus was the Son of God. And on more than one occasion, they prompted the person they possessed to say this or scream this. But Jesus forbade them. Why? Because the time and the messenger were not right. The messenger was not right. Insane people may sometimes speak the truth, but their credibility is poor. The word of God is never to be associated with gibberish or unsound thinking. The message of God should never be spoken by those whose mind is clouded by the haze of alcohol or drugs or the love of sin. Evil spirits who cannot be trusted to tell the truth will only use the truth to gain your confidence that they may deceive you in the future. Therefore, Jesus silenced those spirits as false witnesses. And besides this, the time was not right. Only after people understood Jesus as the sinless Lamb of God who died and rose again, were they ready to hear and understand that he was the Son of God? Only after his death was the world ready to hear the testimony given by that Roman guard who said, truly, this was the Son of God. Now we are not told when Christ went to bed on the day related in our text, since we are told the whole city was gathered at the door, we may infer that it was rather late. Nevertheless, early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus arose to pray by himself. Now, it's interesting to note that this was a Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, and the phrase, early in the morning, while it was still dark, evokes that coming Easter morning when they saw him but he was not there. And when Simon Peter did find him, Christ commanded that they move on to other towns in Galilee, seeking, as he later called them, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The first thing that strikes us is that Jesus began the day with prayer. He began the day in communion with his heavenly Father. In addition to the public prayers in the assembly on the Sabbath, Jesus also prayed alone with God. How blessed we will be when we make time to be alone with God and become aware of his presence. To remember who we are and whose we are. To get grounded in the true context of our lives that context being the one in whom we live and move and have our being, as St. Paul explained it in a sermon addressed to philosophers. Every now and then I will start my day without looking at my calendar. And those are days I regret, as there is usually a meeting or other appointment on my calendar I'm not ready for. If it is necessary to consult our calendars daily, how much more important it is to consult the one who holds time in his hand. Acknowledge the gift of life and all that you have received from him. Review his plans for your day and ask his blessing on what you plan to do. And because we do not live for ourselves alone, pray that others may be blessed by your work and your presence. Then go to your labors with confidence and joy in the Lord. 
Notice what Jesus says as he begins the journey to the next city where he will minister. For this reason, that for that is the is, for that is why I came out. He was focused on the why of life. Many of us struggle with meaninglessness or frustrated lives. We're like the worker who, when asked what he was doing, said, I'm carrying rocks from here to there. Some of us are in better shape, like the second worker who was asked what he was doing. He replied, I'm working a job to support my family. Yes, many of us live the Christian life in order to be paid and maybe bless the people we love. A very praiseworthy, if pagan, virtue. You know, even the unbelievers do that. But the third man, when asked what he was doing, understood the why of his job, and he replied, I am helping to build a hospital that will provide care and healing to countless people in the years to come, maybe even for some people I know. Well, God has given each of us a life, and that means we are given not the obligation, but the privilege and opportunity to honor God and bless others through the work we do and the choices we make each day. It is my prayer that today's meditation on a day in the life of our Lord will help you to reflect on the opportunities you have to live a life of purpose and meaning in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And may that peace of God that surpasses understanding keep your hearts and minds in this true faith, the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We may sit for the hymn of the day, uh, which is 578, Thy Strong Word will sing stanzas 1 to 4 of hymn 578.
time the offering may be brought forward, we stand on signal to sing the offertory on page 190. Jackie Dennis, 
for Gloria Doby, Bob Dowdy, Terry Amy III, Gail Fichtner, Dave Gaines, Tia Gaines, Reverend Joel Holes, John Hopi, Linda Jelly, Sierra Kessler, for Sherry Lane, who's recovering at Rivergate, for Bev, Pat Lone's sister, who is recovering from COVID, for George Martin, Joyce Farrar, sister of Bill Nielsen, who's recovering from COVID, for Martha Oliver and Roy Oliver, who are both in recovery from COVID, for Candy Petrie, Jamie Flats, Sydney Reardon, Brian Rochlow, Jerry Ruling, John Shute, who has had some improvement, for Joe Tyson, Sandy Warfield, Jeff Wicker, Linda Winters, Lori Williams, Zoe Zimmerman, who has also uh, had some significant improvement. For them we pray and give thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our shut-ins, those who are listed in our bulletin, and especially for uh, Harold Smith, who is uh, entering into hospice care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those who are in need of special blessings for Chris, Paul, William. Um, Ray, Denise, Melissa, Crystal, Sarah, and Bladen, Rick, and Mia. Also uh, for Sue Phelps, who is being treated for cancer, a cousin of Bonnie Eichels. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. And we pray for the family of Phoebe Elliott, 12 year old, who was killed in a car accident on the corner of Telegraph and North Line. This is the second uh, death on this corner uh, this year. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember those who have suffered in this way, that, that you would give guidance to our civic leaders as, and police as they consider what can be done to discourage accidents of this kind, the loss of life. We also pray for the perpetrator whose, whose life had many signs of, of trouble. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, make us more effective, encouraging uh, people to be delivered from drugs and recklessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus. Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the solitary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.